Hello, and welcome to DevConf, everyone. My name is Michael Navarro. I'm a senior container infrastructure consultant with Red Hat. I've been with them for about two years now. Previous to that, I was a system administrator and engineer, Linux, for a major hosting company. Did that for the better part of a decade. Uh, I'm joined today by my two coworkers, Michael Zamont, Michael Didato, and I've been fortunate to work alongside them for about a year now. I'll briefly hand things over to the other two mics to introduce themselves and let you know what we're here to do. Over to you, Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, before I get started talking about myself here, uh, I want to address the elephant in the room, and that is that, yes, I have seen Suits. No, I am not the dude from Suits. And yes, I'm aware I look like the guy from Suits. It's a good-looking dude, though, I'm going to say. But, uh, so now that we've gotten that taken care of, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about myself. I am Michael Dodato. Uh, senior Ansible consultant, been with Red Hat uh, a little over two years now, been in the IT space for about 15 years. So uh, I am a certified architect, uh, and uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn, email. Uh, I reside in Tampa, Florida, so any Boston sports fans here, thank you for giving us Tom Brady, and uh, we, we enjoyed it. And uh, sorry we've gotten so good at hockey. So with the, now you know a little bit about me, I'm going to pass it off to Mike. Thank you, Mike. So my name is Michael Zamot. Uh, I've been working at Red Hat for around seven years, working with OpenStack, OpenShift, or Red Hat Virtualization, you name it. Um, I have around 15, 20 years working with open source, uh, and I've been involved in open source communities in Costa Rica and United States. Uh, getting back to you, Mike. Thank you, Mike and Mike. It's been both an honor and a pleasure to work alongside both of you. With that being said, let's dive into what we all came here to see today. Let's start talking about automating our uh, OpenShift cluster deployments. We'll do this by leveraging uh, policies in the Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management software, which, we will, uh, which I'll be referring to as ACM from here on out, and utilizing the Ansible Automation Platform framework, which we'll, we, we will be referring to as AAP from here on out. Uh, we're going to use this to really simplify what is normally a very manual, a very time consuming, and over, most importantly, a very error prone process that is deploying clusters. On the agenda for today, next slide there, please. On the agenda for today, uh, we will be taking a closer look at both ACM and AAP. Within ACM, we will be exploring how we leverage the agent deployment, and then we will utilize the policies to control the various aspects of the cluster deployment. At the same time, we will also be taking a close look at how we employ AAP to create user tokens and manage GitLab webhook triggers. Next slide, please. So to bring it all together, what exactly are we doing? We're going to uh, take an existing cluster running ACM, and we're going to use it along with AAP to deploy any number of additional clusters with, with a virtualized control plane. Uh, why would you want to do such a thing, you might ask? There are several reasons, really. Uh, but the main ones are cost savings, time savings, and versatility. Typically, in situations where we do deployments like this on a large scale, there's already been significant investment in terms of time, money, and effort in legacy code. Uh, utilizing ACM policies to trigger AAP playbooks allows us to reuse this code without the need of substantial uh, retooling. This brings significant savings in both in terms of time and money. Uh, it also allows us to leverage new concepts and ideas in ACM without reworking or discarding the legacy code. Now that we all know who we are and what we're doing here today, I'm going to go ahead and hand the reins back to Mike so that he might explain why we made some of the design choices that we made and start walking us through how this is all really put together. Mike, over to you, good sir. Thanks, Mike. So I want to give you guys a little bit of the lay of the land here. If we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, and give you kind of our use case. We were working with a client uh, who had hundreds of uh, bare metal hosts, uh, bare metal nodes that they used, and uh, hundreds of huge OpenShift clusters and thousands of single node clusters. They had already had Ansible automation for deploying these clusters, but it was one and done, right? Like, so it was the automation deployed a single cluster at a time, serially. Each cluster deployment took about four hours to, to do. So 
they wanted to move to virtualized control planes. All right, we were going to virtualize uh, the control plane on a kubevert cluster and reclaim all those physical masters, make them worker nodes, and you know, uh, save some money, uh, save some hardware space, do all kinds of great things. So they wanted a pipeline that would do that work. All right, they wanted a single pipeline that would deploy the clusters and manage the clusters afterwards. So their original playbooks and pipelines, I mean, there was had over two years invested in developing those playbooks, modernizing those playbooks, updating those playbooks, keeping them running, just care and feeding, right? So obviously they were gonna give us two years to do this. The best they could offer was two weeks, right? We needed to get a working prototype in the lab, two weeks. So obviously we couldn't take every Ansible playbook and convert it into an ACM policy in two weeks. It was just impossible. So we needed a way to bridge the gap and put both things working at the same time, right? We needed to reuse the Ansible playbooks we had, leverage ACM policies where possible, uh, and make them all work together. They also wanted this pipeline to manage the clusters afterwards, but different groups within the organization use these clusters and want to manage them in different ways. Some are comfortable with Ansible and they want to stay with Ansible, right? Some of them are in a more cloud native type space, you know, and they want to move to ACM policies, Argo CD, that kind of stuff. Well, we have ACM policies for that, right? So they, if they wanted to deploy, uh, just give us a manifest file, pop it into a policy, ACM will deploy it. If they wanted to use Ansible, create a role to deploy your application, commit it to the GitLab, put, it in a, put that role into our deployment playbook, and the pipeline will execute and it will run it. So that's a little bit about the use case. Now I'm gonna go through the steps of this. Uh, so step one, obviously, a user commits some code to a GitLab repo. In our repo, uh, which we'll send a link to or have a link in the slide later, uh, shows all the, has examples of all the playbooks, ACM policies, everything that we use. Um, so the user commits code, and in our case, we decide to move with a straight Ansible inventory, Ansible inventory, group vars, host vars. So you put your cluster in the inventory, define out all the specifics of that cluster in the host vars and group vars. You know, think network configurations, uh, naming schemes, all that kind of stuff that you need to actually deploy a cluster. Uh, gets set as a host var for the cluster, right? And that allows us to deploy either one cluster or 10 clusters, however many you want to put in your inventory, you can apply, you can apply uh, and deploy all those clusters simultaneously. So we committed our code into GitLab and then we configured a webhook in GitLab that would send it uh, and hit AAP and start the deployment process, right? So. AAP would sync with GitLab's repo and pull in all of the uh, host bars, update its inventory, <clears throat> and then it would run its pre-deployment playbook. So in this pre-deployment playbook, all we would do is take all those host bars and group bars, pump them into Jinja templates, make the ACM, uh, uh, the Kubernetes objects that ACM needs to be able to deploy a cluster. Um, so once ACM had these objects, it would automatically start deploying the clusters that we asked it to deploy. Next slide, please, yep. So ACM comes out here, it makes your managed cluster, that managed cluster is joined. It also applies any ACM policy. Uh, so think install operators, uh, you know, uh, configure LDAP, whatever policies you want to apply to those clusters, uh, and it'll apply them. At the same time, our AAP job is just sitting there waiting, and it's waiting for the clusters to become available. As soon as it sees that the clusters are available, it goes ahead and puts a label on the managed cluster object in ACM that we said will equal post provision equals true. Uh, that can be anything you want, uh, but that's just what we decide to use. And what happens is we wrote a policy on ACM that looks for this label on the managed cluster object. And whenever it sees that label, it kicks off 
and sends an API call to AAP and starts the day two task, your post provisioning task. Uh, and this can be anything you want in your day two world, right? It could be, again, deploying other operators. It can be managing external DNS. It can be uh, configuring monitoring. It can be whatever you want it to be. Right? And uh, so it starts its post deployment. It reaches out to the managed clusters and does all the steps in that playbook. And that's it, that's the flow. Uh, overall, it's pretty simple, but it allows us to leverage ongoing management of these clusters because, like I said earlier, if anybody wants to uh, you know, deploy a new application as an Ansible playbook, right? Uh, we can just put that in there, uh, commit the code, the, the pipeline runs, and all this stuff is idempotent, so, it will change anything that needs to be changed to deploy your application that you just put in, uh, and you can continue management that way. Uh, if you want to deploy something as an ACM policy, you write that policy, put it in the Git repo, ACM syncs with that Git repo, and automatically makes the changes onto your, uh, your managed cluster. So uh, that's the, the 10,000 foot view of this process here. So now that you've seen this, uh, let's talk about something I didn't talk about. Uh, why didn't we put Argo CD in there? And the reason for that is pretty simple. ACM does almost all the functionality that Argo CD will do. Uh, under the hood, ACM and Argo CD, they're generally the same, right? They, they work under the same models. They can perform the same tasks. So there was no need to put another piece of software in here uh, when ACM already does those, those tasks. Uh, the second biggest reason is Jinja just way better than Golang templating? I said it, you can fight me on it if you want. It is, like, and if you don't believe me, try querying, you know, some data from Redfish, getting something from HashiVault natively inside a Golang template. It's super difficult, but Jinja, super easy. So that's why we decided to use AAP with Jinja templates to make all the Kubernetes objects that, that we want to do. Um, so if we move on to the next slide here, now that we've talked about that, let's talk about what are ACM policies and how they help uh, you know, work your clusters and manage your clusters. So uh, an ACM policy, plain and simple, it just defines the desired state of your fleet of clusters. So you can write a policy, say to uh, install an operator or in our case, trigger a post deployment uh, and all you have to do is put that on your ACM and then with some type of selector, in our case we chose a label selector, uh, but there's a, a plethora of other choices that you can use. Uh, and it will apply to either a single cluster, all the clusters in your fleet, or just a group of clusters in your fleet. It's really up to your imagination how you want to manage these things. Um, so, and you can have one giant playbook or, or one giant policy. You can have hundreds of different policies. It, it really doesn't matter. Like I said, it's up to you how you want to manage your, your fleet of clusters. So the policy engine in ACM works just the same as Argo CD under an application subscription GitOp, GitOps type model, right? So you have your policies in a Git repo, you make an application, you subscribe it to your Git repo, ACM, connects to that Git repo, looks at all the policies, brings them in, and if you wanna make any changes, you do it in the Git repo. So you submit your changes, ACM automatically syncs and gets that policy. Um, so it's very easy to manage, very easy to scale, uh, and very easy to have that single source of truth. Um, policies can be put in an inform or enforce state. So let's say uh, in production, you didn't want to enforce this policy, you just want to know and be alerted uh, that you have a cluster that's out of uh, compliance, uh, and then you want to manually go in and, and look at that, right? You can put it in form state, it'll tell you, hey, your cluster's not in policy, you need to go look at it. If you put it in force state, ACM will, will make it right, or at least attempt to make it right. So if there's uh, an operator that's not installed, ACM will, based on your policy, put all the Kubernetes objects that you defined in there to deploy that, that operator. Um, so it's, it's very powerful stuff. 
So now that we know about ACM policies, let's see how we link AAP and ACM together. And it's way simpler than you would imagine. I, I wanted to come up here and tell you, like, we hacked the Gibson, like we did all this hard work. Uh, it's not, it's just pointing and clicking. So uh, all you need is an AAP token. Go to any user in AAP, as long as that user has access to whatever workflow you want to trigger. Go in the user section, click tokens, grab the token. All right, store the token somewhere secure, because once you get off that page, the token's gone. Uh, and you'll have to create a new one if you forget it. That's it. Now, on the ACM side, it's not as simple, but almost. All you need is a Kubernetes secret. You create that on the ACM hub cluster. Uh, all that secret contains is the URL to the AAP instance and the token that we just grabbed. Plain and simple. Now that you have that credential, you need to link it to a policy. So we had our post provision policy that we created and we wanted to link it to AAP to handle our post provisioning job, right? So you make a policy automation object in the ACM hub cluster. You tell it which policy you want to link AAP to, and then tell it which credential to use and uh, what AAP job you want to run. And then anytime that policy is seen to not be in compliance, it will reach out to AAP and kick off the job. Uh, we're using that to post provision, but it can be, like I said, for anything. Let's say anytime you wanted that policy to um, trigger and create a ServiceNow ticket or do something in JIRA or send to PagerDuty to alert somebody, uh, you can do all those jobs. Anything outside of the scope of uh, a Kubernetes cluster, uh, you know, AAP can manage that and Ansible can manage that, so might as well leverage it. So. That's it, once you have those objects all, all together, your ACM instance is connected to your AAP instance and you are ready to go. And so now that you're all bored of hearing me talk about it, I'm gonna pass it off to Mike here and let him show you it in action. Thank you, Mike. All right, so what do we have in here? As mentioned earlier, uh, we have a dedicated ACM hub cluster that will deploy multiple clusters. Uh, it can be one cluster, 10, 10 clusters, 20 clusters, whatever you want. Each cluster will deploy, we have a virtual control plane, and it will be running in OpenShift virtualization. We have a dedicated cluster just running OpenShift virtualization, and we're running the, no, the VMs in there. Each of these clusters will also include bare metal nodes. In our case, we're adding two bare metal worker nodes to each control plane um, where we're going to be deploying our application. But what's the best part of using this combination, AAP, ACM, is that in order to be GitOps, I mean, in order to adopt GitOps, we don't have to just discard everything with it, all our battle-tested playbooks, all our code that was like really, really tested over several production maintenance windows and whatnot. You don't have to get rid of that and start getting more risk again. You can reuse that investment you can take that into your entire workflow and still use it. So that's actually pretty cool. You don't have to deprecate your, your playbooks. You can keep the best of both worlds, policies, playbooks, into a single unified, integrated GitOps workflow. So in our demo, our automation, uh, let me, okay. In our demo, our automation includes two playbooks. And they will be triggered, as Mike mentioned earlier, by the webhook. As soon as ACM detects there's a change in the, in the repo, it will automatically call AAP and trigger the playbook, okay? Um, it doesn't have to be just with a push. It can be also with a merge request. It can be when you create the merge request or when you merge the merge request. Or maybe you can set it up for issue creation. You set it up, you, you decide what you want, in our case, we push a commit, it starts the entire workflow. And is it running? So in our case, in here, we are just setting, we are just creating a regular push. We are just doing a, a, a commit. And as soon as we do the commit, it's gonna trigger on the right side uh, the deployment job. But more on that in a little bit. So just from this video, as soon as you push, it automatically detected and started the workflow, okay? 
But so what about the playbooks we just wrote? We wrote two playbooks. The first one will deploy the OpenShift cluster. Uh, basically, what this will do, um, we have a bunch of templates. Uh, you call it like the cluster deployment, Azure cluster install, the managed cluster, and the infrastructure environment uh, CRs. We create all of these resources, and automatically, as soon as they are created, ACM will generate an ISO that we use to boot up our VMs. And we use the same ISO also to boot up the worker nodes. All of these resources are created in ACM. Um, but all right. Another of the beauties of using Ansible is that we can fetch values. Uh, we can fetch information from external sources not managed by Kubernetes. Okay? So for example, in our case, when we were tuning the clusters for, for performance, we needed to consider the NUMA nodes and get some isolation with the CPUs and whatnot. If you have worked with this, you'll know that HP and Dell present the course in a little bit different way. So it makes it a little bit harder. You need to know what platform you have in order to render the right template. So we reach up to Redfish, we get the vendor of each node, and that way we can create the, the appropriate uh, performance tuning for the node. That's just one example. You can, for example, update DNS after the cluster is deployed, or before the cluster is deployed, you can automatically fill everything on your template. And it's completely item voting. Uh, you can run the automation a thousand times. If your cluster is already deployed, it will just basically skip it. I mean, it's not going to skip it, but it's not going to change anything. If you don't have a cluster deploy, it will deploy that cluster, and the other ones are, are just going to be fine. So in here, um, this is immediately after the push. You'll notice, um, is, it, is it playing? Yes. You'll see it's running the deploy right now. That will make sure to deploy the cluster. Um, the last step of this playbook, deploy cluster, will add the label that Mike was saying. It will add the post provisioning label true into the manage cluster object in ACM. And as soon as ACM noticed that, you notice that the policy goes into non-compliance. Then he start running the play. He start running the second playbook to deploy our application. And now it's running the. Right now it's just finishing, adding the label, and then the application is up and running. <laughs> so once the control plane is up, the managed cluster. Uh, we add the worker nodes, we patch the managed cluster to add the label, the post provisioning label, and the post provisioning work. Uh, our clusters are being deployed fully dual stack, um, static IPs, and bonding. We made a really complicated M state template just for our use case, and it's been working fantastically. And honestly, I don't think it would have been possible if we did it with Go template because it has a bunch of lookups and Ansible modules that we just bundle into it. That makes our life so, so much easier. So much easier. No, this is not. All right, so you can find our code in GitHub. The address is right there. Um, basically, if you take a look at the repo, uh, if you want to deploy your own cluster, you only need to modify the group bars and add the host bars with your IPs and basic information. It works nice, totally offline. You can use it on a completely disconnected environment. Um, but you will need, though, to have an OpenShift virtualization, Vault, and uh, AAP, and ACM. You can run everything on a single cluster, though, as operators. And with this, I'm getting back to you, Mike. Thank you, Mike and Mike, for giving us all this great information. Uh, so there you have it, folks. We have multiple clusters deployed automatically by a single Git commit. We were also able to see existing Ansible playbooks work side by side with ACM policies in order to complete all deployments and post-deployment tasks of the cluster. To recap what we accomplished here today, we made a single unified workflow for deploying and managing OCP clusters utilizing ACM and AAP and Git. We saved time and effort by automating 
uh, the deployment and as well as reutilizing the legacy code. We made the deployment process item potent, which is super important. Uh, cost savings, we uh, enacted some cost savings by virtualizing the, the control plane. We enabled the use of ACM policies for cluster management while maintaining the versatility, comfort, and ease of AAP. Now that we've all seen, seen the nitty gritty of how this all works, I'm sure there must be some questions for us. I'd like to go ahead and open up the floor to any queries or thoughts you might have for us. Anything? Anything at all? Yeah, I just want to say this is a great presentation. Um, do you think this could be applied to a use case where you're deploying OpenShift in a disconnected or air gapped environment? This was completely deployed in a disconnected environment. Oh, awesome. Yeah, this is fully offline. <laughs> oh, that is great. That's great there. Hey guys, thank you for the presentation. You reinforced the word I didn't put in many, many times. Uh, is it a property of the tools that you're using that uh, they, 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 I mean, they make it easy for you to do those things in an item potent way? Or you, were you guys just being smart about it yourselves? I mean, it's because I feel it's very, very difficult for you to apply things in generally in an item potent way, right? I, I usually screw up. But I mean, why don't you guys tell us how you do it, how you did it? So the item potency is basically a feature from Ansible. Um, every time Ansible creates an object or something, it's going to render pretty much the same template. It's only going to modify what's different. Uh, and because we have a single source of truth, which is Git, and all the host bar and group bars, it's going to apply always the same templates. It's always going to render the same information. So ideally, there's not going to be any change. If you change your source of truth, in this case, one of your configuration files, then in that way, it's going to apply a new value, right? But this is one of the properties of Ansible. I have one question. So your managed cluster is how big is worker node and um, master node? How big, uh, how many nodes do you have, basically? Uh, physical nodes or yeah. on yeah. the OpenShift virtualization? Yeah. Uh, in our cluster for this exercise, we did three master nodes set up as workers too. And we had an um, anti-affinity policy, so each each virtual control plane landed on different nodes. Um, yeah, how many spoke that's controlling? How many spoke? Each a spoke? Yeah. Uh, I don't think we're using spoke cluster, right? Oh no, we deployed two clusters using the agent. Yes, we deployed two clusters for this exercise, um, but that's about it. We deploy a three, three master node, two worker nodes, two clusters. So how do you upgrade then OCP? OCP release keep on changing. How do you upgrade your clusters? Do you have any optimization to upgrade these clusters? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. How do you upgrade OCP versions? Oh, how do we manage to upgrade the, the, the versions? Um, well, we just patched the cluster version object on the, on the clusters. We have another automation that we didn't include in here that takes care of all the upgrades. Another piece that we could bring up without having to rewrite everything. Yes. And uh, one thing we want to kind of get the customer away from, right, is, is necessarily doing those in-place upgrades, right? We want to get them thinking about these things. You all heard of, you know, uh, uh, was it pets, or cattle, not pets, right? So originally I had said it took four hours to deploy a single cluster. With this workflow, we were getting it down to 40 minutes, right? In 40 minutes, we could deploy a cluster and we could do that simultaneously. So we deployed five clusters in 40 minutes. So the idea was to get them to those blue-green type deployments where we were like, hey, just deploy a new cluster on the new version, move your applications over there, and you're good to go, right? Um, so in-place upgrades were something we were trying to, to move them away from uh, uh, with that. So we don't have an upgrade playbook in our repo, uh, but like Mike said, you, you can add that uh, just pretty simply. Another problem, as Mike is saying, like. We don't like to do in-place upgrades for a reason, and our customer has really limited maintenance windows, and upgrades takes a long time. And especially when we are doing upgrades, we are doing major version upgrades, and it might take even two, re two major releases sometimes. And it's difficult because you have to plan at least eight hours just to complete a, a full upgrade. Um, so we are trying to promote the idea that they should rebuild their cluster more often especially when they are virtual control plane. Thank you. Any other questions?
Doesn't have to be about this. You just got questions about your life or something. Like I'll, I'll make up something. It's cool. No, all right. Everyone has perfect lives. All right, that's great. Like I'm happy for you. All right. I'm gonna pass it back here to Mike here. Wrapped up. Well, it looks like well we were supposed to be out of time here, but we actually got five minutes to spare. Either way, I do want to thank you all for joining us for this presentation, and I hope it's been of some small use to you. Thank you for being a wonderful audience, and we look forward to meeting and greeting you all throughout the, the conference. Have a great day, and please enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you, Mike.